it's a great pleasure and indeed an honour to speak uh, to the fellows this evening. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me at the back? Good. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very conscious that uh, some of you will be specialists in archaeology, but will know nothing, nothing about herbals and herbalism, medieval herbals, and others will know of medieval herbals, or perhaps are specialists in manuscripts from that period. Uh, forgive me if my remarks are, are not uh, uh, of the highest academic standard. Um, I felt I had to talk to a mixed audience, and I would lose half of you immediately, uh, or the other half, uh, very quickly. <laughs> Um, the, the, I think the format is that I should talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then Stuart and I will take questions. Stuart has done far more archaeology and digging at Zion than I have, um, so he will certainly take the archaeology questions. I will take any others that are appropriate or relevant to myself. Um, I want to really look at, at four areas, four main areas. We'll look at the archaeology. We'll look at the library at Zion, which was one of the, the best libraries in Europe at the time. And we will look in particular at the medical section and Betson's level. <coughs> and I want to finish on a, a rather strange, but, but you will see relevant note, which is a, a love affair between a Carthusian uh, monk across the river at Sheen and a Bridgetine sister at Zion, which was conducted by interlibrary loans. <laughs> <coughs> I also want to start with a health warning. Um, I'm not a, uh, a chemist, I'm not a doctor. I know nothing about the power of these herbs. Um, there are 700 plant names in, um, in the book. Uh, some of them are duplicates or Latin or uh, even Greek variations of the same name and English and French. There are 400 remedies. Some of them are lethal. For example, the one containing powdered lead for an antiperspirant. Don't use it. Some of the plants were called mortifer, the bringer of death. There is even one called viduam faciens, the widow maker. You have been warned. Beware. Okay, let us start with the first slide. And let us start at the beginning. Is the person who's writing the book about Henry V in the room? Is the person who's organising the seminar on Henry V in the room? Good. <laughs> <laughs> this is the scientist's portrait. Um, he's next door in the council room. He only ever shows his left side. And the reason for this, we believe, it's not certain, is as Prince of Wales, he was sent north to Shrewsbury by his father to counter an invasion or some malcontent dispute with, as usual, the Percys. When the Percys got to Shrewsbury, they brought with them Welsh and Cheshire archers. Archers, of course, were Henry's forte as well later on. And uh, in the heat of the battle, he was 16. He was the Prince of Wales. He raised his visor, and an arrow came straight in and lodged against his spinal cord. And very unwisely, he broke it off. Um, he, this battle took place on the 21st of February. And for future reference, it is quite interesting that the Feast of St. Bridget, whom Henry will favour shortly, was the 23rd of July. So he lay ill for a week until they could get a physician up from London who literally forged his own tools on the spot. You can see it in his manuscript in the British Library. He invented a corkscrew inside a tube of elder. You know elder is coming. He put the corkscrew in. He managed to engage the remains of the shaft and to jiggling he got it out. And he disinfected it with white wine. Now, this is to tie it in to St. Bridget, but more importantly, as Prince of Wales, Henry was given a book, What a, a, a Christian King Should Do. And this book cites from the revelations of St. Bridget. She was a persistent and difficult woman who spoke truth to kings and popes. She's also the patron saint, not surprisingly, of Europe. 
Um, this book says the only way to stop the incessant wars between England and France, and she's referring to the Battle of Crecy in 1343, I think, so sometime before, 1346, thank you, um, was that the King of England should marry the daughter of the King of France and get the throne, their matrimony, through marriage. He was given this book. So, when he comes to the throne, what does he do? He picks this up. That the rider to Bridget's statement was that it would only succeed if they founded a Bridgetine Abbey. An abbey following the rule and uh, regulations drawn up by St. Bridget. One of his first acts in 1415, this week 600 years ago, was to lay the foundation stone of Sion Abbey. At that time in Twickenham, it turned out to be unhealthy. This was a very common occurrence in medieval monasteries. They often moved, and they moved subsequently to Sion House. What was Henry doing? He was holding the French ambassadors and talking to them while getting his army and navy ready to invade France. This is February. By October, he has wiped out the flower of French chivalry at Agincourt. He is the regent of France, and he's about to marry Catherine of Valois. He spent £500,000 of modern money setting up Zion. What a marvellous investment, and what a payback. Eight months, I don't know, you've got France. So, superb. <laughs> and here we see the great seal of Zion. Um, you can see at the top there, I've got a little pointer, you can see the virgin and child, and holding what is perhaps the rod of Jesse, I think, rather than a, uh, rather than a lily, and there's the child, but underneath there is uh, Henry and Sir Bridget, um, pointing towards the virgin and child. Um, here is the flag, I think, of England, and there is the arms of France quartered with the arms of England. Uh, this was commonly held by all kings of England, not just Henry. Kings before him still maintain their claim, but there it is, it's come true. This is the seal of Zion. And here's St. Bridget receiving the revelations in which she is told by Christ himself the King of England must marry the daughter of the King of France. Um, here's St. Bridget. She's writing. Literacy was very important. The Abbey had 60 nuns and 25 men. The abbess was in charge of the men, although that was the subject of some dispute. Here you see a typical Bridgetine nun with a corona, this typical headdress. You can see it with five studs for the five wounds of Christ. Um, one of these nuns has been said to have walked very recently, been seen. And there is one of the deacons. He's wearing a badge there with four tongues for the four um, preachers, the four great doctors of the church. If I can remember them, they are Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, and... I'm sorry. Here is a marvellous um, uh, emblem of pilgrimage. There's a bonnet and a satchel for the pilgrimage to Zion. People would go out from London for the pardons, the indulgences. And here is a crown, I think, shown at your foundation. And that's their, their flag or emblem, a griffin with a bar. I'm not sure. But this picture has lots of interesting medieval iconography, which is worth teasing out. And here's Simon House. Looking at it from the river, there is the Percy Lion on the top. It now belongs to the Dukes of Northumberland, rather peculiarly. Uh, that line was supposed to have been reversed when the ninth wizard earl was locked in the tower for, I don't know, a large number of years. He turned around so the hindquarters were facing towards the king. Um, and this is the back where Simon Abbey may well have been, like the church may well have been located. This lawn is more shortened in the picture. It's much longer. And here is the location. The house is there. The abbey is here. And then perhaps this was, um, the, uh, the house was perhaps the monk's cloister. We don't know. The nun's cloister might have been here. The abbey church is here. But we have not yet completed the archaeological excavations. Time team dug there. And here you're introduced to the first archaeological conundrum. They had ten bays. 
Well, that would have put the, the Abbey Church, we only discovered a few here, well underneath this bit here. We don't know if the Abbey Church continued. And they show a small spire. That lasted until Cromwell's uh, time, uh, um, I mean Thomas Cromwell, and it also lasted into Somerset's time um, when it was finally pulled down. What did it look like? A Bridgetine church was very special. They had reversed everything. The high altar was here, at the west end. Bridget was very firm on this. And then the nun's altar is here. Can you, can you see it? The nuns are up here, in an enclosed area, probably with their benches sideways, so they could look both at the high altar, look down from up there, and look onto their own altar. And the only way to get to this altar, they were completely cut off, you can see there's a gap there even, was for the, the officiating priest to walk from here somewhere, round, up the steps, and onto the high altar. <laughs> the library was probably about here, because we know that they could walk directly from the library with their sermons, the monks, into the church. And the sermons were in English. They spoke in the vernacular. Here is the screen, going around, the geras, so called, geras, so called, just here. Um, we think the one at Zion might have been made with Swedish iron, which was shipped over at the time of the building. And the laity could come in here, in this area, and then you have the high altar there, and then there are numerous other altars here, another one there. Here is uh, the confessional, and the nuns would come in from their side and go in there. And uh, they, there was probably a, a way out there into their cloister, you need to go downstairs to get into the nuns' cloister. This is from a Dutch illustration. It has only five bays, not the ten bays that the time team has drawn up. And that would fit much more ne neatly into the space that we're looking at. So it looks something like that. Here's the library down here in the 1480s. It's late. Probably armoria uh, uh, closets in the cloister before that. So the library, 1488, books in the cloister had about 1,747 volumes. Um, the classic book on this is Vincent Gillespie. I, I don't think he could be here tonight. You probably know this. This is one of the corpus of British library, medieval library catalogues. There is a pile that high, nearly as tall as me, of all of the medieval catalogues. We'll come back to this. This, uh, this one is Sion Abbey only. It was, revisited, it was visited by a woman, Mary Bateson, in the 1920s, who did the first edition, marvellous first edition. Vincent Gillespie had the benefit of using ultraviolet light to get some of the erased entries. Reduced us. This book will never be surpassed by system. Um, Thomas Betson, who we're going to talk about in a moment, was the Christos Library there from 1481. Major collection in the library was sermons. <coughs> the medical, medical section, the B section, 55 books. And certainly, he wrote the Sign Abbey catalogue, that's what we're looking at, and also the herbal, and he also wrote one or two books of devotion, which we'll talk about in a moment. Only 43 volumes out of 1747 survive. And this is typical. Kerr, someone was talking to me earlier about Kerr. Kerr worked on this. He showed very categorically survival rate about 5% 5, 5 in the UK at identifiable books from particular monasteries. Uh, someone called Nedermeyer, who's German, did the German catalogues and the Swiss catalogues. He came to much more Germanic, 4.2% survival rate. It just shows you what we've lost. Two of them are medical. This is a typical book. So it's on board. And here, this is the back of the book, you have uh, a piece of horn, underneath it a piece of vellum with the catalogue number, the title probably, and the secundo folio. The first two words of the second page as a unique identifier, nailed in by very distinctive little nails. So the librarian, must, or someone in the library, had a little box of tiny brass nails. And sometimes you find the books with the plate missing, but the nail holes are still there. They were laid, contrary to our usage, face down on the shelves. So you came in and you looked at the back. Very odd to our way of thinking. This is given by uh, Dr. Doyle of Durham University. Some of you may know him. He, has, he discovered several of these books. He kindly gave me this photo. 
And here's the first page of the Sion Abbey catalogue. It's in Corpus Christi in uh, Cambridge. This is A, you can see it. And um, that's where it starts, of course. A is Bibles, but B is the medical section. And the medical section starts with medical astrology. Medical astrology by an Arab source. And the next one is diagnosis by urine. Again, completely different to what we might expect. 55 volumes. One of them has 30 different uh, titles in it. So we can say there are perhaps several hundred, if not thousands, uh, different books within the whole medical section. Where did they get these books from? Very briefly, I won't dwell on this. This is just to give you an idea. You can see the Greek tradition flowing into the Latin and the Byzantine, Byzantine feeding back to us, going into the Arabic tradition. You had Syriac, Jacobite, Christian, people who spoke Arabic, feeding back into the schools of Salerno and the schools of Toledo. And if we look at that, using that color scheme of red, blue, black, green, and so on, this is what Sion had got. It had got the Greek tradition, it had got the Latin tradition, it had got the Arab tradition, and it had its own English herbals. Some of you will know Gilbertus Anglicus, the Compendium, Bartholomeus Anglicus, and so on. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, John Murfield, Sinanoma and Breviarium Bartholomei, Barts. This is Barts Hospital. The synonyms are the list of the herbs, which we are similar to what we've got in here, and the Breviarium is uh, a guide to remedies. He also wrote a Florarium, which is a guide to the looking after the sick. The first thing a sick person had to do in going into hospital was to make a full confession. You have done something wrong, that's why you're ill. Uh, again, very different to us. This is what we have in its most beautiful form. This is Scarlet Pimpernel. This is from AD 512. That is the date of this piece of manuscript. It was discovered, can you see it, in Istanbul, Constantinople, after the fall, as the Arabic. The most beautiful piece with the text, there's the Greek text flowing around the, uh, the picture. This is by St. Edmunds, the Herbal of Apollaeus, about 1100. Look at this, is a must. You would not beat this in modern illustration. And the, the brambles, even the blackberries, are red and black together. Absolutely beautiful piece, identifiable. Um, and they had this, uh, a printed copy of this at Zion. The printed copies started off rather poor. How do we know where these have come from? There's the, this is the Dioscorides up there we're looking at, 500. This is the chart of how it broke up. And our copy is this one. It's come down a long, long line. We are printed 1483. Now these, the black ones are the surviving copies. That's how we know. Um, using that, I, I think someone here has worked on the way that manuscripts, the parentage and descendants follow. This is rather a poor illustration from the 1480s. Uh, that is, anyone guess? Plantain. Not very good, but it gets better. This is 1530. Look at that for an illustration. Hand covered, absolutely stunning. German, of course. Simon had a large collection of uh, medical books which were unique. They were found nowhere else in the country. If you wanted this book, you had to go to Zion. Um, one of the medical books I put in, in here for mental health, the Maleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of the Witches. Only one copy in Britain, as far as we're aware, and that was at Zion. Um, this is using the corpus of medieval catalogues from the British Library. You can look and see if there were any other copies of books. It doesn't appear anywhere else. And this book, the Lumen Apothecariorum, a charming book, absolutely beautiful, the kind of book everyone here would want. Beautiful print, clear, large margins. The author was dead by the age of 30. So, rather a quick and sad end. And there is the Malayus, a hammer of witches. And what do we get in Betson? None of this. We get uh, librarians. 
notebook. Mandy Marvin is here tonight from uh, St. John's, Cambridge. Uh, we're very grateful to, to them for allowing us to uh, use these illustrations. This must have been done on a Friday. No, the pipe. It's fish. <laughs> this is uh, better than it is best or worse, I suppose. Uh, there are lots of this that Stuart and I still can't read. Any offers, very gratefully accepted. But we have one amazing survival. This is probably um, an indulgence or something of that sort given out to pilgrims at Zion. Um, and here, there's the Virgin and Child. Here it says TB, Thomas Etzel. There he is. Nearly outside on blades of grass. You can see the grass here in the background. Day Zion. Um, Erler, who is uh, very good on these subjects, said this probably refers to uh, not um, Betson, but to the, the origin of the piece of paper. T.B. Thomas Betson. He's heavily tonsured, obviously, and you might like to know that within this, there is an entry uh, on dandelions. And one of the Latin names for a dandelion was Caput Monarchi, a monk's head. Because once he'd been shaved and tonsured, it looked like a dandelion head that had had all the seeds blown off it. Then <laughs> um, Leonis Lion's Tooth, it says in the text. So we're pretty certain about that. What do we know about Betsy? Born in the 1440s, um, entered Zion in 1481, probably the same person who was uh, a vicar in Wimbish in Essex. We'll come on to how we know that in a moment. Um, he was librarian for most of his time. He had a very long career in Zion. Um, he only saw two great abbesses and four confessor generals. So he was, he was the continuity man. He knew what was happening. He knew how things were. Interesting person. How do we know he came from Essex? Um, there is on the internet an, a tool for <coughs> analysing dialect. It's called e -Laume. It's from Edinburgh, not surprisingly. And by applying that to Betson's text, we get that Wimbish is where he was apparently supposed to be a parish priest here in Essex. Um, we get Billericke Sudbury. This is done by taking manuscripts from the, the 14 and 1500s, a, a 1400 rather, a little bit before Betson, but probably worthwhile doing. He will have retained the linguistic features of his childhood, probably. There is another one uh, from the Kent Sussex borders. We know which manuscript he used, we know that it originated there. Um, so this is, it, it's not certain evidence, but it seems pretty compelling that the uh, Thomas Betson, who was parish priest in Wimbish, is the same one who went into Zion. And here's the herbarium, uh, laid out in two columns. You can probably see here just about, um, it says, I, Gallice, abbreviated, Anglice, Gallic, or Garlic. Anyone know what Garlic is? The spear-shaped... Gar is a spear shape, it's a gar fish. And Kensington gar or gore is a spear shape, it's a gland. Garlic. And then urtica metal is here, you see, urtica metal. So this is the beginning, this is where it starts, the first page of the 700 plant names. And then this is the beginning of the root, of the, the root bar, the beginning of the recipe. <laughs> and um, it's, that's where the, the last bit finishes, explicit. And then promatrice, take rhubarb. Matrice is one of those awkward words. I think probably today you could get away with saying for period pains, take rhubarb. Matrice was the womb or you know, certainly a feminine rather than a male complaint. And uh, take rhubarb. And here it says laxativum. It's a laxative. And there it says oleum rosarum. This is what Stuart and I grappled with for the last two years. As I said, some bits of it we just never, ever managed to translate. So it's the transcriptions. What are the principal illnesses in the remedies? Interestingly, sore eyes, 24 hits. Probably because spectacles were not common, although we have found a pair of spectacles at Zion. Just the frame, minus the, the glass. Uh, so bad eyesight, and uh, Betson was getting very elderly, of course, he was in his 80s, towards the end. Um, fevers, particularly tertium and quartum, malarial fevers. Malaria was endemic 
in the Thames estuary and as far north as the Solway Firth. It was a type of malaria which doesn't kill you, just makes you pretty sick. It wasn't the tropical malaria. They treated it diagnostically, this is a fever, give you something to bring the fever down. So we don't, we don't think they've actually got a cure. But um, tertiary important, you could have both. Every three days and every four days. Pretty nasty. So you can work out the kind of multiples of the days you're going to feel okay. <laughs> this is when the, um, uh, the bacteria or whatever it is in your blood reproduce and release themselves. You feel pretty sick. To the other illnesses there, gout, nine, in superioribus particles, in the upper parts. I'm not quite sure. There are two absolutely amazing recipes for gout in Betson. Don't try these at home. One, you need a very thin dog. You kill it, you stuff it with frogs, you hang it in the sun for a fortnight in the dog days, and then you take out the frog legs and you put the right frog leg on your, I think this is right, right leg, and the left frog leg on your left leg, and the gout goes. <laughs> believe that? You believe many things. Um, the second recipe for gout is almost as good. Um, it is you take one owl, first catch your owl, you put it, a dead owl, you put it in, the, in a, an oven covered by a tile until it's reduced to powder, um, and when it's reduced to powder, you make it into an ointment with a pig's fat or whatever, and you rub that in. Um, this sounds uh, quite interesting. However, when you look through the remedies available in the Middle Ages, um, they have similar ones. Raven, baked, and reduced to a powder and made into an ointment was good for epilepsy, and so on and so forth. Um, there are a whole range of birds which were used in these remedies. And if you include um, skylarks, peacocks, and swans as birds which were eaten, I think the Middle Ages was a very bad time uh, to be a bird. <laughs> and there is a nun wearing glasses. So one of the major ailments was sore eyes, probably a lot of smoke, very smoky in the church, smoky in the kitchens and so on. Uh, probably burning charcoal, I suppose. At the Salisbury Cathedral, 1430. Stuart, with, with, um, was this like the ones we found at Zion? Yeah, precisely. Yes, yes like this. We, we bought a light sheet. Marvellous thing. You put it behind the book. Uh, again, Sir John's uh, kindly let us do this. And there you can see a, a marvellous bull's head watermark appearing. There are six or eight different watermarks in the paper that Betson used. This leads us to suspect that he, he somehow accumulated, I hope he didn't tear it out of the back of the books, um, uh, 266 pages of paper and trimmed it all. Some of them are vellum. Somehow or other we got these. Uh, we don't know what they are. We've looked. This bull's head is the most common watermark. I think there are several thousand in the classic uh, guide to watermarks. We don't know where it comes from. Uh, if anybody can help us, the watermarks are on the internet. I can give you the code. You can download them. You're an expert. There's another lovely one, a bull's horn here, and then what looks like a star, presumably between the head of the bull, so that there would have been another bull's horn on the other side. This leads us to suspect that this, this book has been put together. The gatherings suggest there is a, a text before the gathering which uh, is pretty well datable to 1500, and the herbal occurs after 1500 in the gatherings. If we assume the gatherings were put together in the order they were written, then the herbal is after 1500 and before 1517. We know of no other herbal compiled in Britain before the Reformation. John Fakenham, who was a candidate to become Archbishop of Canterbury, although a Catholic under Elizabeth, he died in the 1580s. Just before he died, he also wrote a herbal. He was the last abbot of Westminster. You might, pushing it a little bit, say, this is a monastic hole. Westminster Abbey was no longer an abbey in that sense by the 1580s. <coughs> CSI. Um, there is, we don't know, possibly Betson's fingerprint. And he's the person who wrote to young novice nuns, learn to keep your books clean. So, a <coughs> smudgy... Um, <laughs> Fingerprint. I put this in, this has got nothing whatsoever to do with Zion Abbey. And someone said, oh, there's a better one, there's an Italian one. And here we have a cat. 
it looks to me as though somebody's actually picked up a cat and stuck it in a bottle of ink. I just said, he's gone to lunch. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's not, nothing to do with science. The end of the world as we know it. Can you see it? No, you can't, because it's here. You wrote it in tiny, tiny ink. I'll show you what it says. Hello, Domini. Hello, D-N-I, Domini. Uh, um, 1500. Per ibit. Omnis caro per igne. All flesh will perish by fire. Mm. Well, it didn't happen, did it? So, but there it is. And perhaps he was a bit worried, you know, forecasting the end of the world. There it is. I ought also to add at this point that Betson was very fond of practical jokes. Um, is the person who's writing uh, the paper on enamel on metal in the Middle Ages, are they here? Well, one of his favourite books was how to, how to put your initials on your knife. You know, enamel it on. And another uh, thing which he cites is um, how to convince people an apple is possessed. You take one large apple, core it, Keep the core, you're going to need that. Take one large stag beetle, put it in. <laughs> put the top of the core back. Put it on your desk, in the library, on a dull Monday morning. Apple starts to <laughs> starts to move that bit. Medieval librarianship at its best. <laughs> so perhaps this isn't the false in the same category. Now, we're moving near to the end of the time. Let us get on and become more serious. This is the most beautiful illustration. Salve Felix Anglia. Hail and blessed England. Salve Felix Anglia. And here the Welsh family, perhaps the Tudors, and various, there's a line, various uh, pieces, more medieval like an opera. Here is the arms of England, quartered still with France, Henry, and here are the arms of Carrigan and Castile. There is a pomegranate tree for Catherine of Aragon. So this is the most beautiful. You can only see Shakespeare. There's more in it. More than goes on. Look at it. The castle there. The ship being by. Absolutely beautiful. This is early. Unfortunately, it becomes much more serious and not. <coughs> Here is Richard Reynolds. 1485 to the 4th of May, 1535. He refused the oath of supremacy. He is the sole martyr produced by all of the 27 Christian monasteries in Europe and in England. Um, he was a fellow of Corpus Christi. He spoke Hebrew, Greek, <coughs> Latin, and English. He was hanged, drawn, and quartered. Nasty. And his college mate, one of his college friends, was executed in front of him. And he preached while this would go on. Uh, they were trained as preachers. You can see he's wearing the sign of badge now, of the four doctors of the church, and his famous line, utterly memorable, a sharp breakfast, but we dine in heaven. This is the end of Zion, 1539. He takes pieces as a Victorian, but an emotional portrait, probably done when the nuns came back. They did not give up the keys, they did not give up the seal, they went to the Low Countries. They ended up in Lisbon, they came back to England after Catholic emancipation in the 1860s, still holding some of the manuscripts and books. They also had, reputedly, the uh, a piece of the gate on which Reynolds Quarter was exposed. Reynolds' sister was a nun in Zion for another two years after his execution. And there is the villain. Is Hilary Mantel here tonight? No. Um, Thomas Homer. He said, we will get Zion by premonering, by impinging on the king's uh, legal rights in England. And they set up a case. Uh, the Bishop of London connived at this, and uh, that is how they got it. How they got signed, how they got them thrown out. A footnote. <coughs> William Turner, herbalist to Somerset, he turns up at Zion ten years later 
and he does what I think is unique. He does a post-Reformation audit of the gardens. And there is a complete list of all, not the normal plants, he didn't say lavender, rosemary, and thyme. He says, these are the rare plants I have discovered at Zion in 1549. It publishes the, na the names of herbs. It actually says, I found these at Zion, or at Sheen. He was on the other side of the river, he lived there, but he came across to Somerset, across the river. It's only hardly 50 yards there. And he says, there are pomegranates at Zion but their fruit cometh never to perfection. Somerset must have liked to hear that, because next in line was this lady, Mary Tudor. And of course, some, um, Turner has to leave, flee the country, uh, when in fact the pomegranate does come to fruit, and Mary Tudor takes them. Now, this is the back. We decided we would do another audit of the plants using Turner's lists and see what was rare in Turner's time, is it still there? Some of you will know what this is. This is a ha-ha. Yeah? It dropped so sharply to keep the deer or the cattle out of the rivers, the rivers down here somewhere. Starry Bethlehem. Turner says, I never saw it in England, saving only in Sheen, hard by the Thames side. At that time, it was on, sorry, on the other side of the river. Now, um, Topher Martin, the head gardener, um, he says, excellent clump of these on the side of the ha-ha. How nice. So we have an audit in 1549 and in 2014. I don't think that can be matched. If anyone can match that, that can tell me. Okay. And now we will finish on a love story. The interlibrary loan love story. Joanna Sewell, yeah? We don't know where she was from, but we know where she's buried. We can identify she's buried against the grill, in Stagiaras. She was having nightmares, and she may also have been in love with a Carthusian monk, James Greenhow, probably from Lancashire. And you can see down here, I don't know if you can actually see it, a sagita per ambulante in diem, et I can't read it, but I'm going to From the arrow that stalks in daylight, and the terror that walks in the darkness. So this is, Joanna Sewell, this is written by Greenhow for her, and it says Saint Saviour at the top, here, Saint Bridget, uh, Our Lady, and Saint Augustine, protecting her. He sent her this. He also sent her another a number of other books with underlinings and their initials, James and Joanna, intertwined. This isn't going to end well, you can probably guess. In one book, this is the Incendium Amoris, the bonfire of love. God's love, you understand, yes? And it was by Richard Rowe of Hampel, some of you may have heard of him. On opposite pages, this is in the British Library, Amor Dei Vincitonia, the love of God will overcome everything. You think of Chaucer's prioress, she had this on a pendant around her neck. People know this. It's in a strong man's hand. She writes, Gentle Jesu, have mercy on me. And then he writes, Mens est tibi, I'm thinking of you. And she tries to write in the year 1500, but she can't manage the Latin. And she stops. And then the last line, this is a fine line love story. You will never read this last line in any novel. It is the best line you will never read. It's wet on the page. I have wiped out. Greenhalgh is summoned. They find out. They say, what is going on, Greenhalgh? I've done nothing wrong. We're sending you to Coventry. He goes to Coventry. And he says, I have done nothing wrong. They say, this is obduracy. You are going north. He said, to Lancashire? No. He's a Lancastrian. You're going to Yorkshire. You're not Peter. <laughs> you are going to Kingston upon Hull. That will cool your ardor. <laughs> this is me inventing. Uh, Kingston, I looked up the weather. It was at the beginning of a minor glaciation. <laughs> so, 
And Joanna saw we don't know what happened to her except she was kept on. Part of the rule as a section on grievous defaults. This is a chapter house. So the 60 nuns, 58 of your sisters, you and your Alice. Joanna Sewell, perhaps, we don't know, this is pure speculation, goes in. And the rule says, for grievous defaults, the sister shall come in, she shall strip her back, she shall kneel down, and she shall be beaten by two sisters. And not likely until the abbess tell them to desist. Again, the past is utterly different than how we imagine it. But I thought we'd finish on just a slightly lighter note. So Green Helg has gone north to his fate, and Joanna Sewell has remained here. They both died in their 50s. There's a very interesting footnote on what do you use for bruising? If you're badly bruised. And yes, John Gerard said Solomon Seal, good for women's willfulness in stumbling upon their husband's fists. The marvellous phrase in Gerard's, the master of the tongue in cheek, and probably on the woman's side, I think, here. Yeah. Constantinus Africanus, of which they had a copy in Zion Library, the Gistrum, he said, he said, if you've had an upset in love, what you really need is wine, music, and more women than men, you know, for help. Um, that, was writing, that was written in Tunisia in the 800s, probably not suitable, suitable for Brentford in the 1500s, different climate. And Betson has a very strange footnote. If anyone can find this, I would be delighted. I have been unable to track it down. Fatwa beans, this is the sycamore tree, the one that Matthew climbed into to see Jesus. They, they're um, tasteless figs. Fatwa gives us fatuous in English, modern English, it's just tasteless. And he said they're good for those who are lovesick. Betson may have seen all of this as the librarian. Thank you very much. Um, six miscarriages, um, 
the, um, there are no pomegranate trees there now. Um, 
more plants, and somebody else said more herbs. Um, I mean, I, the answer is read the book. I think the one that might grasp people's imagination is St. John's Ward. Yeah? Everybody's heard of that. It has, it's mentioned many times in the list of plants, which Betson got from the physician to Edward III, John Bray. Uh, so it was already 100 years out of date when Betson got it. And it's mentioned as a fuga demonum, you know, uh, to drive out devils. But in the remedies, it gets one mention. It's very useful um, if you rub it on your hands, snakes won't bite you. <laughs> it says nothing about, you know, curing uh, mental illness or uh, depression, none of that. And in fact, St. John's Ward, the name seems to have applied to a whole range of plants. It actually applied to henbane at one stage, in some herbals, because they were collected on the Vigil of St. John. I think that's the 23rd of June. You know there's that famous line in Beckett's Malone Dies, I might get to Easter, I won't get to the Feast of St. John. <laughs> 20, uh, 21st or 22nd of June. Um, urine, yeah. Um, urine, so who was that? No, that was just a... But it's serious, you see, what is interesting is that Betson cites uh, a long text on urine which was circulating for hundreds of years before this, in the 11 and 1200s. The Germans called it the Hahn Traktat. Some of you may have looked at it. And it leads us to think he might have written the herbal when he was a parish priest, because he cites evidence that uh, urinology can prove virginity, pregnancy, and recent sexual intercourse. It's rather odd for a monk in an enclosed <laughs> monastery with nuns. Well, I think it's odd, but anyway, um, he, he cites that as having, and then um, there is a no another citation for tertian fever, and he said, Marvelous quotation, it says, um, Urina nigra, black urine, semper mortalis, et mala, always <laughs> nasty and fatal. So, so not antibiotics. Nothing. Well, they may have had antibiotics, <laughs> but they wouldn't know that name. Yes. Um, the 43 volumes where they kept together, um, we don't know. The, the distribution seems sporadic. They're not occurring in one place, as it were. There may be more out there. When we retire for drinks, I can introduce you to the great game, which involves the British Library Incunabula catalogue. A third of Sion was printed books, and looking up where the, the Sion Abbey medical books are now, and comparing it, if you can go. I've looked at all the volumes in the British Library in the World Cup. None of them, none of the medical books, are from Sion. But there's plenty in Oxford and Cambridge colleges. So if you want to join the great game, come and talk to me. Um, uh, uh, yes. Um, calendula. I, no, I don't know about calendula. We showed the remedy to a, a, a herbalist. Stuart and I had lunch with her recently with, with Linda Voigts. And uh, she's a white coat herbalist. She said some of these remedies they just make me tremble with fear. <laughs> <laughs> and she's done chemistry and uh, trained as a herbalist. Does that answer all of your questions? It does indeed. Thank you. Um, and John and Stuart, thank you both very much indeed. I, I feel that there was uh, material there if we'd allowed you to do, you've illuminated both uh, Bridget Hand monasteries, um, medieval herbalism, medieval libraries, um, there really has it's been very rich, and um, as I say, I think I, I've learned a huge amount. And uh, I was amused to read on the website um, when I looked before you uh, before this lecture that you've written somewhere. I'm looking for copy editors. Betson's writing is at times perplexing. <laughs> uh, I thought, yeah, actually, having done a very small amount of translation of medieval Latin myself, I think we really. If, should congratulate you and your colleagues for the hard and obviously um, very diligent work that you've done to illuminate all this, uh, this information for us. There's clearly a huge amount of quarry in this new book. 
um, for, for students of, of, of medieval medicine and doubtless many other things too. So thank you very much indeed. I think we've all really enjoyed uh, your lecture.